all the questions you have to ask when you go into putting something together to get published. And I'm using mostly things that I've done because that's what I know. And I've done a number of different kinds of things. So that's a good cross section. Next page. So publishing starts with a manuscript. A manuscript is an author's original version of a book, pamphlet, article, or other document prior to its publication. Manuscript is from the Latin man, manu and scriptus, meaning written by hand. Next page. Back in the old days, people like Henry David Thoreau, who was writing in the mid 19th century, wrote his manuscript by hand on long paper, sent it to a publisher who then typeset it and sent back a loose leaf copy to prove. And that's what everybody did. Next page. And by the mid 20th century, you had someone like John Steinbeck who was sitting at a portable typewriter typing away. <laughs> and at some point, either he was editing and proofing that before it went to a publisher or someone else was doing that for him. And then eventually he got proofs and he read through all that. Next page. And then you have some strange 21st century guy who's sitting there with two computers, a printer, a scanner, and a digital camera doing everything electronically. Nothing leaves the electronic world ever. Next page. This is a list of questions that if you're writing anything and intending it to be seen by someone else, these are questions at some point you have to ask and answer. Who's my audience? How do I want, and I'm speaking specifically of doing a genealogy or a family history. Excuse me, are we gonna have access to a copy of this? Or I'm uh, it's trying a, to figure on, out how much notes to take. I can email her on, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's all as a PDF, sure. so yeah, we can do that. Yep. Who is my audience? How do I wanna cite my sources? What kind of genealogical format do I wanna use? Ascendancy and descendancy are the You're going to go basic through and types. answer all these, right? Or give us examples. I'm getting these examples. Yep. How do I want to organize my genealogy or family history? What's in the table of contents? How, how are some materials best presented as appendices rather than in the main text? Do I want photos, maps, plans, original documents? Do I want color? Color is great, it just costs money. Do I want an index? Who's going to edit, who's going to proofread, and who's going to format what you write, and then who's going to design the final product? What size and format do I want for the final product? And the technical questions, what thickness and opacity of paper do I want? What kind of binding do I want? How many copies do I want? How do I want to market and sell the book? And finally, do I need an ISBN or an LCCN? And I will explain those in great detail. Next page. Good questions. <laughs> Publishing is easy. Writing is hard. If this, I mean, what is told was, how do you publish a book? And I don't want to be too cute, but you write the manuscript, you send it to a printer, and it gets printed. I mean, it is that simple at, at one level. Um, but I don't know what kind of questions you most want to have answered. So if you've got particular things, either either technical or or you know, twenty thousand foot. Let me know. Question. Right. Um, my understanding is that people that are like writing novels or actually other kinds of works too will submit a trans a manuscript, <clears throat> and a publisher who's going to handle the production and sales also has editors that go in and will read and make comments and and different levels of editing yeah, that's one way to do it yep and i'm wondering if you are not in that situation i mean unless you are i don't know uh, arthur schlesinger and your books are getting published <laughs> by somebody and they're going to do that for him um what how do you do editing mm -hmm. just going through and finding like oh this 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 is formatted differently than it's supposed to be or whatever. Um, do you do that yourself or do you, are there people that will do that? Like what a copy editor does? Well, a copy editor would be primarily what I'm thinking mm -hmm. of. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. All right. 
very tedious. Any other burning questions? No, I just know that I can't proofread my own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, I like I like to figure out. I'm grappling with you know how traditional to be with the notation, mm -hmm. um, and I have some personal preferences that aren't the traditional notation. And I wonder if that would just mm -hmm. sabotage anyone else mm -hmm. having anything to right. do with my work. All right. Yeah. Well, like I'm a firm believer in genealogy is of limited value if no one else but you has access to it. And putting words to paper is not a problem I have. <laughs> so I just I started writing and ended up doing one book. I've now done two and I'm on the third. Um, this is and it's for me, it's pretty much a full time job nine months a year because books do not write themselves especially the kind that especially you're writing especially yeah. the kind that you're writing because it's not like you can sit down and just oh i've got a story i've got an idea yeah. no you got to research and footnote and right. you know all that stuff oh so. yeah and then deciding where to draw the line of mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. include or not that's so i'm going to go through a bunch of examples and talk about the kinds of questions of answers to some of those questions. And I'll start from sort of the simple and get to the complex. Next page. So um, early on, I was researching all of the merchants who, and merch, merch descendants and merch spouses who either gave civil service or military service during the Revolutionary War. Just your direct line? Uh, the, uh, the whole the whole merch family i missed a few but that was my goal is to get everybody um and so i produced that in a little it's eight and a half by eleven uh simple formatting uh, next page i did it chronologically starting in 1775 um, there are a couple of merch descendants who answered the call from Lexington and Concord and marched to Portland and, you know, they didn't get any further than that. Um, but this is pretty simple. You decide, I decided what I wanted. Um, it gives, researching Revolutionary War is difficult. Luckily, there was a, a guy who belonged to the Sons of the American Revolution who had a bunch of manuscripts of the Main State Library on a bunch of the regiments from Maine. So I was actually able to find where these guys served, which is pretty unusual to get a lot of detail. Um, so this is a sample page, next page. And I- Why is it hard to research that war? This, uh, because we didn't have a standing army. So there wasn't any centralized- Location, location where, where people was would, focused. were keeping yeah. records. Mm -hmm. So it's really state-based. And okay. a lot of the states didn't have great records. Massachusetts has some fairly good records. But if you read yeah. through that big 17 volume, yep. you know, main soldiers, Massachusetts soldiers and sailors, mm. it doesn't sometimes doesn't easily allow you to distinguish between two people or three oh. people or four people mm -hmm. with exactly the same yeah. name. Well, that's, <laughs> so only, that's, 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 that's the paucity of records. I yeah. Mean, yeah. If somebody joins up as Joe and he joins up again as Joseph. And, right, right. right. And in, in a different town. I mean, right, right. Yeah. And some of them did live in one town and serve for another town, right. Right. which makes it even more confusing. <clears throat> so this is just basically text done chronologically. And I put the sources at the end um, next page, two, two pages of sources. Pages. Yep, yep. Wow. So that means there, there aren't really footnotes, it's just sources at the end. Right, right. Next page. So you enjoyed that project? Yes, yeah. yes, because it turns out there was a merch, actually two, two merch descendants, three. Two, one spouse and two merch descendants who all spent the winter of 1777, 78 at Valley Forge with the army of George Washington, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Yeah. When I've been to Valley Forge, if you haven't been there, it's a great place. And then I used to fly kites there when I lived in oh. Valley. <laughs> so I, that's really, I'm really interested in doing something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yep. My little heel line, it's already 
uh, in the Littlefield genealogy. Mm -hmm. It's already there, yep. but it's not put together as like a booklet. Yep, yep, yep. And this you can do yourself and just go to Staples and buy booklets and yeah. make however many copies yeah, you I want. Like yeah. when, when done. So um, I then, what I'm going to do is put everything on the table rather than have it all shuffling around and you can look at it to your heart's content afterwards. So this is a wonderful family photograph. Some of you have seen this before. This is my grandmother's Swedish family. My grandmother is the little toe head standing up on the far right in the front. Her name was Elizabeth. Um, this is another, it's basically text with some um, gravestone photographs. Next page. And a photograph of my grandmother tending her irises at what was then 22 Salmon Street, which is at the very end of Charles, where Charles hit Salmon. That was the house that my grandparents had built after they were married wow. in 1915 or so. And what I found was you can't scan these photographs. You just take, you put it on a mm. white piece of paper and take a photograph with a digital camera or smartphone. And then you have a JPEG and you can size it any way that you want. Um, you, can, you can scan documents as JPEGs, but whole photographs I've had no luck with at all. Hmm. Yeah. So how did your grandmother meet from Wisconsin meet? So the short story, I have a, I have a presentation on this, which I've done, I think, <laughs> for the group. Yeah. Short story is um, her parents immigrated in 1881 and 1882 to Sister Bay, Wisconsin. It's in Door Peninsula that sticks up into Lake Michigan, mm -hmm. big farm country, a lot of Swedes settled there. Well, when the kids came of age, unless you were the son who was gonna get the farm, you went somewhere else to work. Mm -hmm. You went to Green Bay or Milwaukee or Chicago. My grandmother went to Chicago, became the governess for a family who had a, a young daughter. Well, it turns out the mother of the young daughter was from Belfast. She had married an industrialist in Boston. They moved to Chicago where he was some kind of a book editor. They summered in Northport. At Bayside. At Bayside. <laughs> so after her term was up, she stayed, went to work in the shoe shop where she met my grandfather. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> So again, this is this is pretty basic. Um, you, do, you do it all yourself and just print it out and bind it. Next page. And then a sort of step up. Nice little three ring binder, which was prepared specifically for Debbie Littlefield Bird mm -hmm. and Jill Harvey, who's not here. That's my copy. Yeah. <laughs> Next page. Um, I'm related to almost everybody. <laughs> As am I. I can probably teach. Um, yeah, this well, was big enough that it needed an index um, to go through the Coombs line and then the various ancestries of the women who married into the Coombs line. Next page. Um, this page concerns second, gen second generation Anthony Coombs, who was born in Wells who married in Gloucester because his family beat feet during one of the French and Indian Wars when Wells basically ceased to exist. Mm -hmm. He married the Hodgkins. They then lived in Gloucester and Old Falmouth, now Portland, and eventually Brunswick. And I put little vignettes of those towns as I researched the histories um, in a little box, which is easy to do. Next page. Their kids include, um, child number four is the Anthony Coombs that I'm descended from, I married Ruth Getchell. Child number five is Sylvanus, who is Jill Harvey's ancestor. Child number seven is Mercy, who is Debbie's ancestor. So. I and, think it's like eight cousins. Can't remember. Oh yeah, six, yeah. I think it's closer than that. Fifth or sixth. Six, yeah. He so used all caps for one of the names. What is that? That's his family. That's my family, and that's an indication that that's going to continue on. Okay. 
afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was an easy way to do it. Mm -hmm. There are other ways, and I'll show you other examples of ways to do it. And it's got a fair bit number next to it, too, right? Right, right, right. right. That's a, that's a distant woman. <laughs> ahead of me. I can kind of see. I get a view. Oh, okay. <laughs> so then another step up. You're doing well there. <laughs> um, I produced this for my Upham cousins, and I'll explain how I'm related to them. So this was done at the print shop downtown. Staples also does similar things. It's got a hard stock cover. This guy here, the plastic in the front, and spiral bound. Um, this is, I don't know how many pages this is total, maybe 70, 70 pages. How expensive was that? Back to back. I mean, not terribly, but. But how, times how many copies? <laughs> yeah, I don't remember how many copies. But, yeah, yeah, this is pretty inexpensive. But then book publishing, my point of view, it's pretty inexpensive too. As long as you don't count your labor <laughs> and, your, and your costs of getting to the manuscript because there's a lot of costs there, especially doing genealogy. Yeah. And when you go to Salt Lake City, you just blend that in as part of the- Right, call. right, right. right. <laughs> but the printing itself isn't horribly expensive. So. Did you go to Salt Lake City? No, because oh. now I can go online, though it's tedious. I mean, what I'm researching now is the merchants who are in Trenton and Sullivan down east. And those, those the vital records for those towns are intermixed with the town records, which are all in microfilm, and I can go on family search, and I'm sitting there slogging through. Great, page, 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 page. Page. Oh yeah, and you can hope that somebody <laughs> in this town will transcribe yeah. those records and print them. Yeah, that's what we got. Yeah, yeah. Now, I noticed that this one you did ancestors and descendants. Right. So is that sort of like an hourglass type chart? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. In this case, because I wanted. The connection is a Simmons connection. The connection to me is through a Simmons. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the father of my cousins, Walter James. Did you include a chart? I'm okay. curious. Next page. So, <laughs> of course he did. Of course he did. It's like you read I'll collect mind. for that question afterwards. <laughs> I absolutely adore charts. Um, and if I work in Microsoft on a PC, so if anyone, and I, I can't talk about apples because I don't know what Apple products are, but if you want to do charts in Microsoft, I'm the guy to see. He's giving All right. on that. This is in essence, right. a big chart with lots of lines grayed out so you can't see them. And I fill in little boxes and have little nested, nested cells within them to get those little um, long inverted views there. Mm -hmm. So um, the line at the bottom, um, these are the parents of the cousins that I knew growing up. Did they live here? Uh, in Bath. Yeah. The next line up, Walter James Upham married Lillian May Simmons. So remember those names in a minute. So, next page. And this is a sample. Um, I was. I would produce this for my cousins. So I wasn't writing for professional genealogists. So I wanted to not have lots of footnotes that got in the way, all sources are at the end. And I didn't want lots, lots of nitty gritty detail that they weren't gonna care about. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty simple and straightforward kind of stuff. So if he arrived in 1635, was it Newbury Mass? Cause that was a big... Uh, Boston, it says that John Upham arrived in Boston. Oh on the ship Mary Gold. Mm -hmm. yeah. We even know the ship, which is great. Mm -hmm. Next page. Wow. I love charts. <laughs> it turns out that through um, the Simmons line, my cousins are descended from all those people in red came on the Mayflower. Uh, I don't know if you can see all the colors. Is that green, blue, blue? blue? Yep. Blue. Oh, there is a green. The green is the yeah, fortune, the which green. landed the year after the Mayflower. And the blue is the Anne that land, landed at Plymouth two years after that. 
I have my glasses on, but really, yeah. William who? I, I do. So that chart can get laminated. They do this down street. They do this at Staples. So I just formatted yeah. this on 11 by 17. Although a PSA images was closed. Oh, yeah, okay. downtown oh, yeah. closed. Okay. All right. Yeah. But you can go over across Staples. the bridge. Yeah, and across the bridge. Mm -hmm. So will a pr ordinary home printer print on 11 by 17 paper? No. So you just you, you format your page to 11 by 17, save it as a PDF, go to Staples. Print and they'll it. do it. Yeah. 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 Or actually, you can do it yourself. So how do you fit that into your booklet, though? Uh, just the one that was actually in the book, I just printed out, went to Staples, got 11 by 17, and folded it. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So that doesn't really go with the booklet. Right, right. Away. So is the blue your family? No, these are just okay. identifying the people who came on the first three ships. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Mayflower, so the, the Fortune, and the Anne. You can, you can look at this okay. when, when, when we're done. What I like about charts is that you can identify things that are not easily shown on a family tree on Ancestry mm -hmm. or a family tree on Family Search, like first cousins marrying each other. If you see in the middle there, Moses Simmons marries Rachel Simmons. They were first cousins. I'm collecting a list of cousins that got married. <laughs> no. it's, it was good. There weren't very many people to marry. Right. <laughs> yeah. And you'll see the Walter James Upham and the Lillian May Simmons there. Um, near the bottom. This, this is my chart, because my chart, Lillian May Simmons had a sister, Carolyn. Carolyn married Melvin Merch from Belfast. They're buried up here in Grove Cemetery. And, and this is my chart of that family. Meg commented in the chat here that you can print at Walgreens too. So that might be an option. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Next page. Well, right. switch here. Oh, I know. <laughs> my game. So then there's a step up from stuff that you basically do yourself and print yourself. To answer Rick's question, I mean, all the, whatever proofreading was done here was done by my sainted wife. Because <laughs> you're right, after a while, it gets hard to proofread. Well, you know your what you meant. Stuff. You know what you meant, and it's hard to see. <laughs> yeah. That's why you read what you meant. But the organization, I mean, you're sitting there with an eight and a half by 11, so you don't have to do anything fancy. It's a regular sheet of paper. You just set some margins. And you just put in what you want and put in everything as JPEGs, even if they're scanned documents, you scan them and save them as a picture file so that you can resize them any way you want. And you can move them with the text any way you want. So you just do all that yourself. Well, it is. Tedious, but tedious. it's not hard. So this is, the, this is my wife's paternal family. Robert Harris Jones is her father. And he was from Cal's. And when I started this, I held out absolutely no hope of finding anything because Jones is a terribly common name. <laughs> and Callus is not a hotbed of genealogical information. <laughs> but she can proofread. Yeah. <laughs> this wound up being um, 120 pages. This is a glued binding. It's called perfect binding for whatever reason. I don't know. I had this produced by a print shop in Augusta, right at the end of Route 3, where Route 3 ends on Bangor Street. And you just turn right, it's right there. Um, it's got a nice hard stock cover, uh, no color, eight and a half by 11. Um, next page. So, how yes. many copies of that did you make? Maybe a, something like 35. Big family that yeah, you yeah. gave them to, basically. Uh, yes. Yeah. And there's another version which has a larger version, which is 200 pages, that has my wife transcribed all the basically love letters that she found between her parents. Oh, yeah, nice. which were in a nice. scrapbook. Yeah. So, so this has a table of contents, the starting with the Jones family itself. And then tracing the lines of the wives where I could find them. 
who married into that Jones line. So Dittmars and Hines, Harris. Where's McNaught? Uh, McNaught is her mother, and that would be her maternal oh, line. So okay. I didn't do that one. Okay. Next page. This is a sample of a Civil War pension that I got by sending for the pension records. This is, for me, getting most of the cost is getting Civil War pension records. I mean, they're yeah, $35 eight, a piece. 80. Whoa! 80 bucks a whack. The last time I did one, it wasn't that much. <laughs> What's nice now is that they'll scan them and send them to you electronically. So you don't have to do with all this paper going back and forth. Still charge you though. They're still charging, <laughs> but it, they are a gold mine. I mean, they're irreplaceable lots of times, but that's, I'm, I'm going to, there's something in excess of three or four dozen merges who served in the Civil War. So it's going to be a lot of records. That's probably better than you would get from fold three, too. Yes. Uh, fold the three quality, doesn't. What's that? The quality here is probably better than what you would get online. Uh, fold three is an ancestry subsidiary. But they don't have Civil War pension records. They don't. Okay. No. So right. did you get really this from the National Archives? Yep. 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 Next page. This is a page. At the top of the page is a copy. Can you go of to the. Can you go to the archives and get it yourself and not pay the $80 or you have to also pay? Yes, you can go to Washington to the National Archives. And then you can just scan it yourself there? I, I assume so, but I think you probably, since all their records are stored off site, you need to make arrangements to have those files available for when you're gonna be there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. At the top of the page, there's a book. Uh, this is a page from a book called Representative Businessmen of Callas, which I found at the Bangor Public Library, I think, which is about this George Keene, who served in the Civil War, went to Callas and started a, a commercial shop. And then at the bottom is just a sample of a census page. You go on to Ancestry and make a copy, crop it, save it as a picture file, stick it in, blow it up, do whatever you want. Next page. Look at the car. <laughs> mm -hmm. this, this was too classic not yeah. to include. So this is my wife and her family at Pocomoonshine Lake or on their way to Pocomoonshine Lake. Which is where? And uh, Washington County near, near Alexander. And she's the one holding the basket with a little headband next to her mother. And again, this is, I mean, I've got gravestone photographs and other things, but it's all eight and a half by 11. I mean, I, my wife uh, proofread, I basically decided what I was gonna put in and not put in and was telling a story for decidedly non-genealogical people, her family. So there aren't any footnotes, there's a list of sources at the end but I kept it simple for them. What will become of all of your stuff? Well, um, that's where you publish. <laughs> but yeah, but what will become of all of this? You've already given away a lot to family yep. and- And so various, various libraries have copies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> and that will be- Not online. Uh, correct, correct. Next page. So the story about the Jones, is that the earliest Jones I could find probably was born in New Jersey, just outside of New York City. He went to Nova Scotia and married a Dittmars. Well, it turns out the Dittmars go back and, and the ancillary lines go back to the early, early days of New Amsterdam, now New York, when it was Dutch. Right. They settled in Flatbush in what is now Brooklyn. Um, and were loyalists. So at the end of the Revolutionary War, they went to Nova Scotia. Turned out they were living on land next to where my mother's ancestors were 150 years earlier, because my mother's half of her ancestry is Acadian. And they, these were all um, loyalists who settled on what had once been Acadian land. Dewey Dittmars was one of those loyalists 
who brought his family from Flatbush to Nova Scotia. This is his gravestone. He died in 1790. Where's that? Clement's Nova Scotia? Yeah. 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 Clement's Was this a photo you took? Did you go visit? Uh, this is actually from the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now we're going another step up. In the process of writing the first book that I did, um, I started keeping a list of all the various immigrant ancestors and when they came. And I thought the book was getting too big. I didn't want it in there. So I just did a supplement. I knew what color I wanted for the, the main book and I wanted to match that. So I had to sit there and decide what size I wanted. This is six by nine, which I just think is a nice size. I needed to design the cover and the spine, decide what colors to use for the print and for the background, and then how to organize the inside. This turns out it's page, to be just text. And it's a chronological list of immigrant ancestors. Uh, and then what their connection is to Emerge that I was finding. Um, this again is glued. It's a perfect, called a perfect binding. This was done by Pinmore Lithographers, which is a place in uh, Lewiston. They do a lot of. They do the history industrial works here. Okay. That's where the that's where the where the, the journals come from. Oh, the journals. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. They, they do lots of little booklets like that. They do um, organizational annual reports. They do big color things. You know, but we need color, especially. That's six by nine. That's kind of a standard size. One of the standard sizes. One of the standard for, sizes. For like a real book as opposed right. to an eight by 11. Which is like the main families. Six by nine. Oh, yeah. 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 When you're so on your computer, do you yeah. use six by nine? So pages? you actually you actually go into the computer and go to the page settings, and you instead of having a page be eight and a half by eleven, you make it custom six by nine. Then you set your margins to three quarters of an inch. That's so that when it gets bound, pages all there's line room up. on the edge. Yeah, there's room on the edge, and then you just type. I'm sitting there now on the book I'm doing. I'm actually typing the final page mm -hmm. on a six by nine format with the margins that I want so that I can see, oh, that doesn't fit. You know, I get to blow that up or I get to move it over here. So when I'm done a section, it's done. Okay. Except for proof. Like copy know right there. My like copy is right there. So yeah. you use Word though. I use, I'm working in Microsoft Word. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, Apple can do that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I was finished, I burned this to a CD and took it to the uh, Penmore lithographers. It cost me a little more going there than it would have some at other places, but it turns out the guy I was dealing with is a cousin. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't not do it. <laughs> yeah. But this is all, it's just, as I say, it's just all text. It was just formatting and you know putting page breaks where they work best and yeah. So then we get to hardcover. Most of you are familiar with the main and 1790 series. The difference here is it's kind of binding, it's called case bound. It's a regular hardcover book where they glue things into a binding and hard covers on. Next page. This is volume nine and in volume nine is one of the families I'm working on now, the family of John Merch Jr. Um, is more born in Biddeford and wound up in Trenton. And again, this is just text. If you read any of these, it's Did just. Did you write that no, oh. no, someone else. They're... You wrote the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> I this know is, better. This is all just text. So someone, and I think this, this near, these, these go as separate sketches to Joe Anderson, Joe Anderson yes. in Texas, who then goes through and makes sure this, that everything is in the format he wants. So it's a consistent format, uh, consistent use of, of notes. They, their footnotes aren't separate. They're actually in the text itself, which is a little, a little awkward. Yeah, and, and a nightmare to type. 
yeah. yeah. Mm. And someone proofs. I don't proofreads. I don't know. If, Joe does that. Yeah. Yeah. He's an ace. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, once you, once he's got a format, and it's like doing any of these things. Once I had a format, I just had to stick to it. So your format is on a piece of paper, pasted on the wall in front of you. Because <laughs> if you like me, you forget how did I, how did I do that? Yeah. Yeah. This was the first book I produced, hardcover, which is my merch line. Each full family, each generation, but basically my line. It's a lot of information. Yeah, it's pretty tedious. Not, not just. Um, uh, How'd you create that title? This is about. Um, it turns out that many of the early merchants were fishermen and later merchants were ship captains. And then the merchants or the ancestors of the spouses that the lines they married into served in every war you could imagine. Every single French and Indian war, the early Pequot War, Revolutionary War, War of 1812, the Civil War. So the title just sort of it came at me. I said, okay. and then, it gave me a way to organize the material in the book too. This is eight. Yeah, this is eight hundred pages. I worked with the, and I'll tell you how it got published. I worked with the printer to select a paper that was pretty thick and really opaque, so that when you read a page, it, there's not much bleed through, because I get stuff like this, you know. So it's pretty dark, and you don't want. And if you read junk novels, you'll see, you can see the back page, you know, on the page. Well, that, that you can avoid by using just a, a thick paper. So I just, uh, I'll talk about printing this in a second, next page. Um, this is the so-called copyright page. And on it, you'll see the ISBN and the Library of Congress Roll numbers. Now's a good time to talk about what the heck all that is. An ISBN, International Standard Book Number, it's essentially an identifier that publishers and booksellers and libraries use to, to order a book and list it and to sell it. It identifies the publisher and a specific title and edition and format of the book. So whether it's a CD or a hardcover or software. ISBNs cost $125 a piece. It's a company that's assigned to do them for the United States. But you can buy a block of 10 for $250. And I'm sure you needed the block of 10. Well, I'm going to. Yeah, up. you're going to. <laughs> you do not need an ISBN to publish a book, especially if you're not going to market it in bookstores. A Library of Congress Catalog Control Number, or LCCN is needed to catalog a book in the Library of Congress, which is the largest library in the world and is the foremost repository of everything America has published. I early on decided that I definitely wanted a copy in the Library of Congress. You have to give them a copy. They're not gonna pay for it. Mm. When you get an LCCN, that's one of the requirements that you send them a copy. However, in order to have that LCCN, you must have an ISBN. Um, that was a classic no, catch 22. We work together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I ended up getting the ISBNs, even if I didn't, even I wasn't going to market it through a bookseller, because that way I could get a Library of Congress number and get the book in the Library of Congress. Would you, would you consider marketing it like on Amazon or family out there somewhere? Yeah. Uh, could, could. Um, so far, I've just done through the Maine Genealogical Society and American Ancestors. We were this gen. Um, you send them a copy and a blurb, and they'll eventually publish a little thing. You could also contact like an ancestor. They have all the people that are researching and who they're researching. Mm -hmm. So you could do a search on merch. And find out who else had ancestry and looking for yep. information yeah. about merchants and say, 
Guess what? I have a whole book. Yep, yep, yep. Meg had a question. What about using Creative Commons to register your work? What Creative Commons. I don't know anything about Creative Commons. Mm, they, you can like mark or register things on there as you know open access or basically like you're setting terms to uh, as how your work is going to be disseminated. Okay. And so you can make things copyright okay. free and all of yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Next page. So this is a sample page. This gravestone is at Grove Cemetery. I took that photograph of John Great. Randall Great. Simmons Great. and Mary Jube. John Randall um, Simmons was my direct ancestor. And that Simmons line is what connects me to the Uphams. And that was, that's her obituary that I transcribed from the Republican Journal. Now, I use the same publisher that the Maine Genealogical Society uses. It's King Public, it's King Printing, they're a printer. They're not a publisher in the sense of it being someone that you have an agent and this someone there who's going to market the book and someone who's going to proofread and typeset and do all no. Just like Joe Anderson, I sat there and basically typeset everything, proofed it, got it exactly the way I wanted it, burned it to a CD and sent it to King Printed, Printing, which is in Lowell, Mass. They then run it through whatever machine they run it through and these days send me back an electronic copy to proof just to make sure everything's paged correctly. So actually I have to sit there if you want if you want each chapter to start on the right-hand side, you may have to have blank pages. And you, I label them as such and give them the page number. And I keep track of all of them. So that when I send it, it's, it's I know each page is gonna be exactly where I want it. It's a bit tedious, but well, yeah. somebody's gotta do it. Yeah. And you yeah. can pay that someone. That's what my question was about. You can obviously pay, there are professional proofreaders. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out one of the Merch Cousins that I met electronically who lives in Massachusetts is a professional proofreader. So there are people who do this, there are people who would typeset. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a self-publishing company in Rockland, I'm gonna forget the name of it. Mm -hmm. um, you see them at conferences a lot. And I'm sure they have people who will also take a manuscript and set it up to a correct page and put in photographs where you want it and all that. And, and you just have an index it, just have to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. yeah. you know how many people are in that book? I don't know how to ask that question. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't. Um, the first half of the book is the series of families that are in my direct line. Mm -hmm. Then the whole second half is all the Mayflower ancestors. Mm -hmm. Do you so. have an index? I can't remember. Uh, there's there's an index in the Mayflower portion in the sense that everybody's got a number and they're all listed in front. Uh, the index for the rest of it is really just the chapters. Each generation is a chapter. I, so it's a table of contents. Yeah, so there's a yeah. table of contents. Yeah, yeah. But if you're looking for Samuel, the son of John, who married so and so. There's no nothing in there that would say, oh, that guy is on page 427. Correct. 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 You'd have to follow the line. You'd have to follow the line. Yeah. yeah. Unless you did an index, right? Right. Yeah, and which is expensive. Which, yeah. which is it's yeah, tedious. It's tedious and takes a lot of pages. Yeah. You know? So I'm sitting there creating each generation as a separate freestanding chapter, all formatted to mm -hmm. six by nine, right? So when I'm finished one, I can put it away and then go to another chapter. And then when all the chapters are done, the fun part, you sit there and laboriously, page by page, putting them where you want them, making sure the right-hand page is where you want it to start a new chapter. And when you get to the end, you go in and put page numbers. So, as I say, this, this is about 800 pages. How long did it take you? I mean, I know when you started and finished, but how long was that? This took six and a half years, start to finish, but the beginning of it, I was still working. So it was very much a part-time kind of thing. 
and I had to learn how to do genealogy. I didn't, I wasn't a genealogist, yeah. you know, I was working for state government, writing lots of technical documents. So dealing with mountains of paper and footnotes, that, that, was, that was fine. But doing genealogy, that I had to learn. So a lot of the six and a half years was spent learning mm -hmm. genealogy, figuring out that I did in fact want to produce a book. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I started out eight and a half by 11, because I was just typing along, I could do all this other stuff. Sure. Part way through said, oh, this is really going to be a book. So then I figured out I could resize the page to six by nine, change the font from Times of Roman 12 it to 10, does it all. and it fit almost perfectly page by page. So it was a little bit mm. tedious moving some things around. Yeah. That wasn't daunting. Like that. <laughs> this was daunting. <done. laughs> you were talking about page numbers. Are yes. you saying you went through and added the page numbers at the bottom? You well, you oh, go in as a as a as as a as a footer. Footer. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. then each chapter, you just tell it to start at a different number. Yeah. Or, or you put in section breaks and say footer same as last, so yeah, we right, continuously right. number. Yeah, if yeah. you have it all in one yeah. document. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It takes me to the county. All this the takes you those kids in school. <laughs> to the county. The ancestors and descendants of Daniel F. Tebedeau and Rebecca Jandro, those are my mother's parents. Their lines go back to the earliest settlers of both Acadia and Quebec City. And I do have a wonderful presentation on this that we'll do at some point mm -hmm. when we can have a big screen, a big, lots of. Uh, Sure. This is 1,600 pages. This was just at the limit of what the printer could do <laughs> as one volume. We had to use thin paper. This is much thinner paper than either of these, so that we could keep it to one volume. But I found every single ancestor. And in this book, there are a number of maps, and I was just going to show you some of these as samples. The, the map at the top, if you've ever been to Quebec, there's a big island in the middle of St. Lawrence called Ile d'Orléans, which is basically the bread, bread basket of Quebec. There are tons of ancestors who were there in the 1670s. Uh, this is um, a map from a series of books called Our French Canadian Ancestors. And I just photocopied it and then stamped it, stuck it in. What's great about the French is they did censuses early. In the 1667 census for Ile d'Orléans. Did that's you speak a, French? No. I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> These are all of my ancestors who were there in 1667 oh, no. wow. in the census, which is just amazing. <laughs> it's family still there? Are they the bread makers? I mean, <laughs> around them, right out on the, on the streets, on the roads. <laughs> they have take out places. Oh yeah, it's, it's quite the place. Yeah. Next page. This is a map of the St. Lawrence sort of oriented so I could stick it on one page. St. Lawrence basically runs you know, southwest and northeast and they stick it up straight so that the Atlantic Ocean is up at the top. This I took from another book, a basic map from another book, sketched it, and then added all these little names as a, a little text boxes on a JPEG, on a picture frame. So I could show visually where all these little communities were of, in addition to Quebec. Next page. And these are maps from various, um, from Wiki Commons of various places. One is, one is a great map of Nova Scotia and the other is a map of Port Royal in 1733 what is now Annapolis Royal, Nova Scotia. And this is what I'm working on now. <laughs> this is doing a whole family genealogy is really tough. Because every time you find a merch somewhere in a historic record, you got to say, oh, where's he go? Who the heck is that? <laughs> Where does he go? Yep. In the back, an appendix, unattached families. <laughs> there, there will be an appendix with what we're calling mystery merchants. People that, oh yeah, the oh, puns are. I know. <laughs> um, people that I just 
either either the record is clearly wrong so I don't can't figure out who it is or it's a definite merge but I can't place the person in the family anywhere so I'm up to the fourth generation I've been working on that for over a year It'll take at least a year to do the fifth the fourth and fifth generations are the hard ones because then I'm getting to the 1850 census then I've got Okay, I mean, I'm going to try to find all these people in the 1850s. But those early 1800s are hard, right? 1750 yeah. to 1850 is the hardest one. Yep, mm -hmm. yep, yep. yep. And so, that's, so that's leading me to do lots of sit on family search, microfilm. Little towns. Yep. Little town, town Trenton, town records with the vital records interspersed with, with annual town meeting reports. And terrible handwriting. Terrible mm -hmm. handwriting. Did you go in to find a grave after you did this all and then put it in there too? I do not go into find a grave, but I do use find a grave to find because some cemeteries. there's like wonderful stories on yep. certain people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the, the two volumes of the field genealogy? Yep. yep. Are you going to is it going to be formatted like that sort of or so because it goes by generations? I'm on the sixth generation now. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it'll be done by generation, and this will have meticulous footnotes. So every fact will have a note. I you know, I've got it. At the bottom. Um, I've got a sample that you can see. I, I like the, um, was it the Charles Robert Anderson? Yep. His, his system is you have a footnote and then, then you use little short names mm -hmm. for all of the. And Charlie Anderson does that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, which I've done in this book. You, you can see at the back, there's a list of sources and I've got a little, the little shorthand name for the source, like Trenton TR. Mm -hmm. means Trenton Town Records, see Family Search, Microfilm, Number, blah, 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 that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm not taking up huge amounts of space with footnotes. Now, the little field book, I mean, you, you'll you get a page of text, this much text, and this much footnote. Mm -hmm. That's true with almost even writing like articles. That's true. Right. Right. Record. Right. Part of it, I know Joe tends to do here and after calls. Right. For some of them, right. you know, right. it's the same one over and over and over and over and over again. Well, abbreviation. Will right. you be writing the write-ups be similar to that though? Will they be like like the little field sketches? Uh, the sketch, uh, yeah. More more like in this book. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, I mean, I'm taking the whole. The I'm doing right. This all numbered. Everybody's got a number. Mm -hmm. I like the little field book. Mm -hmm. That's what's. But I'm also trying to include original documents. Gravestone photos. So, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. so yeah. are you only numbering the ones that you follow or are you numbering everybody? Numbering everybody. Mm -hmm. Every merch descendant. So if number. you find one that you didn't have before, you then have 143A or I you renumber. I haven't gotten to that <laughs> point. I've, I've, I've renumbered once. Then you can put in Word, you can put a field mm -hmm. that has a number in it, a sequential number. Right. And if you add one somewhere in the middle, it will automatically. It's yeah, harder to do right. the way that the way right. genealogy are formatted. It's really hard to do. Right. <laughs> right. Next page. Yeah. Um, these are the earliest records that are known to exist of the Merge family. These are uh, town records. You go to the town of York. They have a nice little laminated book with all the original town records. Um, at a legal Town meeting, Holden in York, March the 8th, 1714 slash 15. So it's actually wow, our 1715. Granted unto Walter Merch 20 acres of land if he can find it clear of all former grants and settle in this town. And then the bounds were laid out, and that gives the page number where they were actually laid out. So that's when I. And actually, have one record prior to this, which is when he served on a, on a jury. Next page. Having done a couple of these, I've got some sense of what I want to do. And I actually, the first thing I wrote was the table of contents. This is the easy part. Um, one of the things I'm doing here is what I call it selected history. So to put these people in context, Every time there's a war, there's a little blurb on that war and some dates. Every time a merch goes to a new town, I find out when that town was incorporated. And I have a little box that tells me. I really me, like that. Like, no? because yeah, I, and I did that in this. Yeah, you did, and it, it kind of gave me, I mean, it just made it seem it real. It gives you a fullness to it. Mm -hmm. reading about. Mm -hmm. right. relationship you're not reading to the same stuff 18 times. Right. Right. 
Right, right. And I have a question. Yep. In your earlier books, some of them at least, you traced back all of the spouse's line. Mm -hmm. Are you not doing that with this one? Uh, so what I set myself the goal of was every time a merch, <clears throat> either man or woman born with the name merch marries, I try to figure out the ancestry of that person's paternal line. So if John Merch married um, Charity Cook in Trenton, I'm gonna find out what her cook line is mm -hmm. and have a little short paragraph. You know, she's a seventh generation descendant of blah, 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 cook. You don't like list them all and detail them all out and stuff. Correct. That's two, that three books. Right. Go you back never to, finish. The, to, to, <laughs> right. to the immigrant to the immigrant ancestor right. of that cook line if I can find it. Uh -huh. But what I'm also yeah. specifically doing is trying to figure out all the Mayflower connections. <clears throat> Where you are you It is beyond belief. Now I understand if your family goes far back far enough in Maine, mm -hmm. as you get into the oh early 1700s and then coming forward. Tons of Massachusetts moved, Massachusetts families moved to me. It was still Massachusetts. It was still Massachusetts, no. but just to keep it so that I use those terms separately. So we had a whole bunch of old Cape Cod families. A bunch of them came, who, up, the, came up the shore. Really. Who had Mayflower roots, mm -hmm. who settled in Gorham, Hamden, Castine, Ellsworth. Well, the number of merch connections to Mayflower families is just unreal. And I, I'm now it's a little game where I've got, I've got a list. I know all the 52 Mayflower fans, fans uh, 52 Mayflower passengers who have known descendants. And I'm trying to see how many of those descendants, mm. how many of those Mayflower uh, people have descendants who married a merch or merch descendant. Mm. And I'm up to well over 30. Just but if you get further along, they'll marry somebody and tracing that line. If, if you're only going to you only use the surname, or are you thinking, all right, so here's the wife, and right? She's got a thousand tenth right. generation. Right, right. But family search, you go into family search to the family tree there, and you find lots oh, of Mayflower lines. True, yeah. So I just write them out and then go try to verify. Mm -hmm. And yeah. maybe 75% are good and the, the other ones aren't. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So then each of these generations is a chapter in the book, next page. And then I've got a ton of appendices. Mm -hmm. And you'll see one of them is um, an H, Mayflower Connections. Mm -hmm. Well, I would actually list the name of the Merch descendant, the name of the spouse, the Mayflower passengers who are ancestors of that spouse. And then each of those Mayflower lines, just the Mayflower lines of them, John Alden to whoever. So if someone wants to tra 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 track it, they can do that. So it's sort of like uh, the book they just published of what, 500 Mayflower mm -hmm. connections mm -hmm. yep. with yep. just famous people. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 I, I, no, I haven't seen it. Next day. So this is, and this will be on the table with all this other stuff. This is actually a printout of one family, family of Simeon Merch and Rachel Payne. Rachel's a Mayflower descendant from uh, Barnstable, I think. And you'll see it exactly as it's print, printed on the manuscript that I'm working on. I actually cut out the top part. So you'll see it and you see it exactly how it's laid out. And one of the pages is these are gravestones of Simeon and Rachel from Pond Cemetery in Unity. And then really? I transcribed what's written on them because you can't read it. You got to stand there next to the stone. And I put that right next to the gravestone. You have a lot of merch relatives in Unity. Oh, yeah. I, I have <laughs> that line on my Facebook page. Mm -hmm. I have many, many. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, know, you I know several farming. Yeah. So you can read the story and, and you can read the story in here, but um, 
Simeon and Rachel were both born in Gorm. And Simeon bought, well, he didn't buy land. He wanted to go farm somewhere where there was more land. So Simeon and Rachel put their kids on each side of a bed tick, which is a bed frame, put that on a horse and walked 100 miles from Gorham to Unity to a log cabin that Simeon had built the summer before. And that's where they started. Wow. Yeah. They didn't have to buy it back from Henry Knox or the rest of that, that mess. Uh, uh, <laughs> Simeon eventually got a deed from the widow of one of the Bowdens mm -hmm. who owned about half of Unity yep. at the time. So. Been asking. Have I answered all your questions? Got <laughs> <laughs> a new list now. It's <laughs> really interesting thing. It just makes me wonder why you ever have time to go on vacation. Oh. <laughs> I mean, you get good at some of this, like doing the researching a Mayflower line. You know, when I find one, either in a book or or on Family Search and Family Tree, I can do those pretty quickly. Mm. You know, and they're either right or they're not. It's just that then you get one person who has eight or nine or 10 Mayflower ancestors. Then it gets a little tedious. I, I took a million of them home, and these have really wonderful connections too. Mm -hmm. So yep. many of our early ancestors. Right? Yes, yes. This, what are they? Yeah. It's the Journal of the Main Journal. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. So you, your book title says in Maine. So does that mean you excluded some that aren't in Maine? Or? Marcher. <laughs> Didn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> if so there's, there's a couple answers. Um, there is more than one Merch family in the U.S. Early Merch family. Mm -hmm. There's one in Massachusetts, and I cannot I cannot establish any connection between the Massachusetts the family and the Maine family. So I decided to do the Maine family, which is descended from the Walter, who was in York early, and his wife Deborah. They're probably born in Wembury in the south coast of southwest coast of England in Devonshire. But I can't prove that. The names are just right and the dates right. I can't find any baptism or birth records for any of the kids. I know who the kids are. But I can't find any records. So I don't know where they came from in England or precisely when they wound up in the US, other than the early record I have of him in the jury. So I'm starting with those immigrants. Walter and Deborah, I'm tracing the entire family, at least through 1900. We'll see how big the book gets. Are you going to do, I mean, if somebody went west, are you doing them or are you not doing them? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. They're that from the Maine merchants. I'm up to the fourth generation and nobody's left Maine yet. <laughs> so I noticed, I noticed you, were, you had room, or you're planning to do 10 generations. Yeah. yeah. That sounds like you're going to get up to living people. If I get past, you made that if, decision? I, if I have enough room to get past the 1900, I may stop at the 1950 census. I mean, so there may be which some living, public record. Yeah, mm. which is at least the public record. People can connect easily. Yeah, people can connect easily to 1950. Yeah. Well, we'll see how. Yeah. I mean, if you get. do five generations, pretty much people can collect, connect fairly easily. Yes. Mm. Yes. I mean, it's not. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and it's the fourth and the fifth that are the toughest by far for me. Yeah, yeah. no, I think you're right. Yeah. Well, then, yeah. Yeah. I have a process question. Yes. As you're uh, going along and writing it up, you blank, you know, some date that you yep. only have the year, you don't have the month, or whatever. Yep. So, what I've been doing is I just highlight in yellow missing mm -hmm. missing data yeah. but eventually i'm going to have to get rid of the yellow and decide when to give up on finding mm -hmm. that information yep. Yep. so do you reach a, a point when you've decided that you're not going to fill in some of those missing pieces and just let yes. it be yes and i'll do the same thing you do if i'm mm -hmm. writing along and i've got you know i don't know where the person died i'll say you know where and when died mm -hmm. question mark you know i want to highlight it sometimes when mm -hmm. i when i Print it out as a draft so that I could look at it in mm -hmm. paper. Do you, do you use comments? Mm -hmm. uh, that's another that's way you used to actually it. use comments. Yeah, um, comment feature on Microsoft. Um, and at some point, um, it's like 
researching the ancestors of a spouse. Some of these families I know already. Some of them I've never heard of. Some of them there's information on, some of them there isn't. So I'll eventually say, you know, so-and-so merch, married, blah, blah, blah. Date of birth and parents unknown. I can't find anything. I do have to move on. Do so you get kind of at, at all of that at the at the end? Or no. Do, no, you do it for each chapter as yep. you're going along? Yeah. Yeah, because I want to finish. Yeah, yeah. Put it away. When, I, when yeah. I finish chapter three, <laughs> I want to put it away. Race, but... and then as I'm doing chapter four, I'm looking at chapter three. Here are the kids of this person. Uh -huh. And I can make edits there as I find new information when I'm working on their kids. Did you run across any merch, merch, marriages? Any what? Merch, merch. merch. Say last oh, name. Oh. I could have listed those two. Um, <laughs> so aside from all the Mayflower connections, the absolutely fab fascinating thing is how many merch cousins married each other to the point where I'm actually keeping a list of them and their names. First cousins, second cousins, third cousins. And I only know that because I'm doing the whole family. There's no, there's no way you would know this. Or the ones that married sisters. I mean, they married the sister when their wife died. Two brothers. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, that, yeah. oh that happened. Yeah. I, right. didn't, I didn't quite catch the end of that explanation there. Sorry. I, I yeah. lost it. So you've got these families where they're marrying cousins. Yep. And then what did you say? How? Why wouldn't you, you know that it's merch and merch? You would it was merch and merch. But if it's merch and Cobb, because the Cobb is a fifth generation descendant of merch. Oh, you're going all the way. Okay. You would never know. So there was a merch back in the line yep. somewhere. Yeah, and their cousins, you know, first second. I was only thinking of the same name. Right, right, right. A lot of little kids. Well, and because they didn't leave Maine. Right. And they lived in, and, and, and they, had, they married but somebody. They weren't anymore. You didn't marry somebody <laughs> 300 miles away that you met in college. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You're, you're, you know, if you grew up in Gorham, you married someone from Gorham or Buxton. Mm -hmm. There weren't any other choices. No. So, right. but, but wait a minute. If, this merch, I'm trying to follow this. This merch marries a cob, mm -hmm. and this and cob saves wife. Four generations back, there was a merch. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you have them in your merch collection and following them forward? You know that only if you're doing the whole family. I didn't know that doing the first merch book because I was just doing my ancestral line. line. Yeah, okay. And each. Each full family, and that's all kids. you're doing now. And you're doing well, now every now, merch, right? so May. that merch will show up, and you go, Oh, God, that sounds familiar. And on my family tree maker, I've been doing everybody right. ever since I started yeah. right. long ago, right? And it tells you how you're related to them, and sometimes you're related to them like five or six mm -hmm. yeah. different yeah. ways, yep. and yep. so then you cousins. know that yep. you're related to her and you're related yep. to him, and yeah. You know. yep. Tanya, do you do this? I mean, do you have a like a genealogy program that you set it up, or are you doing it all just research, write it, put it in? Uh, research. I, put, I, I decide on the format I want for what I'm working on, and I'm doing it all from scratch. No, you're doing it all no, in I'm, Word. I'm, you're not doing. Yeah, I wasn't suggesting that. I mean, I don't. I don't ever. I don't ever use their program after you figure it out. But I find it helpful to have a program that does, in fact, as Debbie said, connects people. You know, so the like tree maker does. You know, uh, to do that connection, and then you can. It's it just keeps them straight. You don't have to remember them in your head, you know, right. or on a piece of paper. Right. Do, um, do you not no, use a, a I, program like that? No, I have. I use. I have a family tree on ancestry that I keep adding people to. Oh, okay. Then it's yeah, the same. I do that. That's, yeah. That's yeah. 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 And do they, they they connect you? Do they connect you to? Well, the, say yeah. how you're related to them. No, because you'd have to go add all the. Ancestry um, each yeah. time, which you I don't always every, do. Every person I put in, it will tell me whether it's my sixth okay. grandfather or okay. whatever. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that, that software does, but on yeah. Ancestry, it's not yeah. going to. You don't yeah. have all the intermediate. Yeah. Have you ruled out electronic publishing? Um, no, although this uh, first merch book sold out, I got 100 copies. And I've subsequently had people want copies and I've just burned it to a CD and sent it to them at a reduced price. So. Meg has a question. She has her hand up. Go ahead, Meg. <clears throat> okay. okay, first of all, thank you so much. It's, this is so really incredible. And I love the way that you're, you're sharing all your kind of ins and outs of doing this work. This um, gives you a lot of insight. Um, 
One thing I have is I have two, actually three different kind of family histories that were written by my uh, people from my grandparents' generation. And they're just, one, one of them is kind of like a scrapbook and the other one is more now like a three volume work. Um, and then a third one is, um, is uh, I guess more of a family stories type of thing, but it, it, I've already found errors in it. And so I was thinking to try to improve on those. Like, have you, do you know anybody that has done something like that? You know, where I could, and unfortunately that's where I feel that if, if I, I don't like the fact that they don't give references or footnotes because I can't go back and find out well, why, where did they get that? It doesn't seem to be what you can find in, in your own research. So I thought about um, doing that. Is there, what, if you do something like that, they were never really published per se. So, but um, I, is it like copyrighted or like, do you have any rules about that? Do you have any advice about it? Well, yeah, if they were copyrighted. Yeah, if it's more than what, 72 years old, it's in the public domain anyways. Right. Um, and if it's, I think generally, even if it's not uh, like published, they usually use the date of death for the author. So, but if you're talking, you know, if those people are long gone, then you're okay to sort of like reprint that piece and then sort of add your corrections or your additions or whatever it may be. Or, you, or you just, sorry. Or you just decide to start from scratch <laughs> and then you use this other source and say, well, so and so in, in year 1950 wrote this and um, I can either you can verify it or you can't. I have many family stories that are published in different works, some of which I can verify and some that I can't. Where I can't, oh, okay. I, you know, you know, this person reportedly fought in King Williams, King Williams' War, but I can't verify it. Oh, okay, yeah. And what about the things you included in your in your books, like from Wiki, Wiki something and whatever? Are those things copyrighted too, or um, you know, like photos or any other kind of things they might download from the internet? Well, Wiki Wiki Commons is is. Anybody can use it. You just cite them as a source. Um, oh. Gravestones, I go pick photographs up when I can. Otherwise, I identify the source as find a grave. Um, most of the family histories and genealogies I'm using are out of copyright, so they're available online. Mm -hmm. And where they're not, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm citing a book as a source for a specific item, like a birth date or a death date. And I just cite it as a source. The other thing too, and this is something that, you know, if there is potentially a copyright case is like how wide your distribution is. And so in Dana's case of, if you're only publishing a hundred of these, you know, it's not as wide of a distribution because that's what they take into account is like potential financial impact or audience impact and all of that. And so, yeah, it's the I think the risk for this is pretty low because it's yeah you're not talking you know this is getting published by not, not going to be used in jail yeah <laughs> it's equal to the demand for somebody else's genealogy yeah yeah so good as I think as long as you use the proper citation and you acknowledge where it came from that you sort of covered your your basis yeah, for this. Sufficient like yeah that. yeah right right so not a lot of stuff that doesn't get attributed at all yeah right okay um, can I ask another question it was about the charts because you use that Microsoft Word to do your charts have you tried any of any softwares that um, allow you to like download from Ancestry and create different charts and things? Have you like so you might have decided that Microsoft was superior and like I have that Family Tree Maker which it does more things than Ancestry but I don't really like it. So I'm just wondering how you ended up on Microsoft Word. Uh, I don't I don't like any of the charts that that are. That you buy like like these 
you know, generational fan charts, because if you, if you get cousins marrying cousins, you end up having all their ancestors listed twice. So what you're seeing is actually a gigantic table in Word with a whole bunch of cells, and I make it up. And I can do exactly what I want to do that way. Yeah, you also can move them so they're next to each other. Right. Need to. You can right. move right. this child with this child so that the yep. ones that marry each other are, are going next to connect to each. without yes. you doing <laughs> Right, right. I had this really weird thing happen about a month and a so half we ago. Can, we can we can stop. Yeah. Yes. So okay. there was another another comment in the chat, story. I think, that just came out. Oh, it's there. Let's see. Looks like it's pretty long. Can you read it up onto us? Yes. On, on visiting a cemetery where some of my ancestors are buried. I discovered some people buried nearby whose names were the same as my husband's mother's maiden name. I researched them and eventually found that my mother and my husband's mother are related. <laughs> and my husband and I are eighth cousins. Amazing, since my husband was born in California and I in Pennsylvania, but our mothers yeah. both have upstate New York and Vermont roots. Yeah. So mm -hmm. even in the modern day, it happens. Well, okay. Eight generations was not a modern day. <laughs> so what I, didn't, what I didn't tell you was that, um, so my wife's family is from down East Maine, before that from early New Amsterdam. Her maternal line is from the Midwest, McNaught. Well, it turns out she had a grandmother who was French Canadian, and my wife and I are seventh cousins. <laughs> well, how many people here are cousins with each other? Oh, you yeah. just said many, you've got yeah. two other cousins right many, here in the right, room. Right. Yeah. I wanted to tell this little thing about two months ago, I looked in the obituaries of my hometown, and there was this Jansen family, and my maiden name's Jansen. And they had a big farm with cows outside of our high school. And everyone used to say, are you related? I said, no. Yes, you are. <laughs> well, they spelled it with two S's. So I said, you know, here it was, like 16. So a couple months ago, I was reading in the newspaper that the Jansen mother had died. And lo and behold, her family name was Keeler. So mine was Jansen and Keeler as well. And I just thought it was the weirdest thing, this farm outside my school. And there's another ancestor, but you never yeah. know. Well, Deb is probably right into this. Um, you'll get, I mean, spelling was optional. <laughs> yeah. Right. They had better phonics than kids do today. Though. Right, mm -hmm. they do, yes. Um, but it would get to the point where some families um, family lines adopted specific different spellings mm -hmm. and so and they're all related but you look at the names and you say well that's that's a different family no it's not and that that gets yeah, really get that. well that's the, that's the big thing in Searsport is that the Nichols OLS and the Nichols ELS mm -hmm. I mean, they're, and they were, whoa, 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 whoa. they're all descended from the same guy. Mm -hmm. I have family line where they took the last name and added an E because they got pissed with the rest of the family. Yeah. Right. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's like my, my, yeah. my Southworth, yeah. which are the yeah, yeah. big flowers. They became Southerns up in, oh, up, in um, yep. up in New Hampshire. Yep. You know, they just, yep. you know, it was, it was easier or that's what it sounded like or yep. somebody started writing it. Yep. And you know, the name just plain changed. Or oh, the BYRDs are the wealthy ones. Oh. <laughs> so I have a lot of ancestors yeah, from Appalachia, Western Virginia, Virginia Western North Carolina. Um, right. Well, and they put on my and the first the name, original one was her name is Louisa 